So you'll see um, my presentation sort of nicely dovetails with him and provides different evidence for sort of the same issues just to prove to you that this is not uh, sort of unique cases we're talking about, but this is in fact a widespread problem. So the evidence I'm providing um, are different cases and has a slightly different um, take on it, but you'll see some similarities across these two presentations. And only one duplicate, and we sort of mm, um, came up with our presentation separately. Um, okay, so what we're talking about today is the way in which our common view of the doctor-patient relationship is the way in which the doctors and patients interact with each other within a broader community. But what I want to talk about is the way in which the pharmaceutical industry affects this relationship in numerous ways on numerous levels. Right, so um, we talk a little bit about, a lot about how the pharmaceutical industry influences doctors' judgments and doctors' decisions and what doctors know about drugs. And then a little bit less, although we can spend some time more at the end, talking about how the pharmaceutical industry influences patients' understanding of drugs and patients' decisions. So, uh, as Dr. Kassir indicated, there's been a, a lot of critique of pharma over the last, oh, I don't know, three to five years. And here's just a sampling of the books that have come out that have been critiques of pharma. And so overall, here are some general critiques that are lodged by these books. So the first is this idea of profiteering, the way in which the pharmaceutical industry is making a lot of money um, through the high cost of drugs. So here's some statistics that are, I think, pretty compelling and pretty interesting. So if we look at profits as a percent of revenue, um, if we take the average of all of the Fortune 500 companies, the average profits as a percent of revenue is 4.5%. So you're considered to be doing pretty good if you're in the, top, in the, for, you know, in the Fortune 500 and you're making about 5% profit, that's pretty good. On average, the pharmaceutical industry um, makes an average of 18.6% profits as a percent of revenue. So it's a, um, a large difference, a large and considerable difference. So there is some validity to the claims that uh, pharmaceutical industries are indeed profiteering uh, through the, cost, the high cost of drugs. So the other related to this, of course, is the uncontrolled cost of drugs. And um, there are some statistics to show that as um, the percent of healthcare cost expenditures, it's been pharmaceutical drugs that have created the bulk of that increased cost over the last 10 years. And of course, we have drug safety concerns. The Vioxx scandal and other drugs have shown us that we have reason to worry about um, the FDA guidelines for approving drugs and that that is something we might want to be concerned about. And um, Dr. Kassir has talked about this in other venues. He didn't talk about it today, but there's also um, the notion that the gift giving to physicians on the part of the pharmaceutical industry is quote unquote obscene and should be stopped. Well, believe it or not, I'm actually talking about something different than all of these things. I will be talking about um, a different set of conflicts of interest that arise. One is this way in which um, new diagnoses for new drugs uh, are developed um, on the part of the pharmaceutical industry, not necessarily on the part of independent experts. Second, I'll spend a little more time than Dr. Kassira did talking about um, how continuing medical education is completely underwritten and funded by the pharmaceutical industry and sort of the effects that has in the presentation of materials at continuing medical education conferences. Uh, I'll look at the issue of the data publishing issue of disclosure of conflicts and um, how data might be skewed in the publication of um, materials that were funded by the pharmaceutical industry versus those that are independently funded. And then finally, um, I'm going to look at yet a different issue, which is how researchers are interacting directly with the public in order to promote and market new drugs. Okay, so let's take this first issue, so this new diagnosis for new drugs. So here's sort of a very traditional view of how diagnostics works, right? You have symptoms, it leads to a diagnosis, which leads to a prescription. All right, I'm gonna be adding some complexity to this model to see in how the pharmaceutical industry influences both our ideas of what the symptoms are that indicate a specific diagnosis and how the diagnosis is changed to um, recommend a certain kind of treatment. Okay, I'm looking at a specific example here that I spent some time investigating and examining and attending these continuing medical education conferences and attending, attending the consensus guideline conferences to show you what went on in this particular case. So what we're looking at here is Intrinza. This is a testosterone patch for women um, to treat, here's some information about it. It's in development still by Procter & Gamble. Um, it's a drug to treat hypoactive sexual desire disorder or uh, what is now being called, or what was previously 
perhaps referred to as low libido. This did come in the wake of Viagra as a treatment for men and then a huge amount of pharmaceutical industry interest in, in finding a similar drug that would be available for women. So the clinical trials of this drug were um, conducted on postmenopausal and oophorectomized women, women who had had their ovaries removed. And it's a testosterone replacement patch that's worn all the time. And it is not yet approved by the FDA, even to date. Um, okay, so in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2000, an article appeared uh, reporting the clinical trial results of this new transdermal testosterone treatment. This is the same one that is, um, is made by Procter and Gamble. And it did show that in fact testosterone uh, replacement patch did increase um, measures of libido in, post, in postmenopausal and oophorectomized women. To a certain, you know, the placebo effect was incredibly high in the study, but they were managed to get statistically significant results nonetheless. So in the months following publication of that um, journal article, I received word of a consensus guideline conference that was going to be taking place in Princeton um, in June of 2001. All right, so following publication of this New England Journal of Medicine article, they put together a guideline conference. This, uh, although, you know, this is um, represented as a Robert Wood Johnson Medical School consensus conference, it was entirely underwritten by pharmaceutical companies, and that was detailed in the literature distributed at the conference. So um, in addition to Procter & Gamble, a couple of other pharmaceutical companies who have hormonal products in the works, including Solvay Pharmaceuticals and a couple of others, underwrote this conference. So um, I attended this conference. It's one of these typical consensus guideline conferences where um, experts present for a day and then meet behind closed doors to come up with guidelines for what would be the diagnostic criteria and the symptomatology to lend itself to being, being referred to as androgen deficiency in women. So this is sort of the first time this kind of ex this expression, this kind of diagnostic category was introduced. And um, from this, they did develop guidelines that were then published in Fertility and Sterility, and you can notice the name changed, which is, I think, very telling also. So here we see androgen deficiency in women. Post the consensus conference, it was changed to uh, female androgen insufficiency. Uh, and so the um, authors of this article are those experts that appeared at the conference and then met behind closed doors in order to come up with these guidelines. And um, you can see here that these, um, these authors are the same ones who published the New England Journal of Medicine article. In fact, Jan Schifrin there at the bottom was the lead author on that journal article. And the others also did disclose um, all sorts of financial conflicts of interest at the conference itself. It should be said that at time of publication of this journal article, they were not required to disclose any kinds of conflicts of interest that they had with any of the companies who had androgen products in the works. All right, so, you know, as Dr. Kassiri was saying, we can see that these are the experts in the field, so we shouldn't be all too surprised that they're the ones that appear all over the place, right? They're going to be the ones who are responsible for running clinical trials and the experts we might turn to to create new guidelines for new diseases. However, when this is entirely underwritten by a pharmaceutical company, uh, as we saw some evidence for, there is some reason to believe that it would skew their understanding of the new drug. Um, and it should be said that what happened at this conference and what um, appears in this paper is that all of the symptoms that are defined as, as treatable as, as part of this diagnostic category of now female androgen sufficiency are exactly those that can be treated by a testosterone patch, right? So it's a little bit of a reverse engineering. We already have the drug and then we come up with the symptoms that we think define the category of disease. Therefore, we can prescribe this one treatment that we have available. All right, so what are we looking at here? So, of course, this isn't the first time we've thought of this or this has occurred, and um, a lot of other people have written about other ways in which this has happened, right? So we hear a lot of talk about the uh, perhaps overprescription of Ritalin in American children, and we saw the rise of Ritalin at the same time that we saw the rise in the, diagnostic, in the diagnosis category of um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So there was an increase in the um, number of diagnoses of this disease just as we had a new drug available to treat it. And of course, um, we often hear about the um, use of SSRIs to treat depression and of course SSRI use to, ex to expand to treat a number of disorders that arose because of the availability of SSRIs. So things like uh, social anxiety disorder um, and, and other ones that we see marketed and televised to us uh, on commercials. 
And then another um, example that I studied, of course, is Viagra and erectile dysfunction. Previously, it was called impotence and, wasn't, and there weren't treatments available medically to treat Viagra except for implants and a couple of other things. But um, once we had the availability of Viagra, we had a reframing and a re-understanding of the disease of erectile dysfunction because we had this new drug available to treat it. And um, then there was the case of whether Viagra would work for women. And in this case, we saw the development in exactly the same ways of a new guidelines and a new consensus statement to develop a new disease that, was now, that is now called and still referred to as female sexual dysfunction. Okay, and I'm sure we each have our own pet example in our head right now of um, other drugs that work this way. So I'm not the first and only person to identify this. Recently, um, on the Public Library of Science Medicine online journal, they had an entire um, issue devoted to this idea of what they call disease mongering, which is an even more extreme term than I would potentially use. So you can see the um, range of articles that appeared as examples of this idea of disease mongering. So what do they mean by that? Oh, let's see, this is out of order. Here's disease mongering. So in our view, disease mongering is the selling of sickness that widens the boundaries of illness and grows the markets for those who sell and deliver treatments. It is exemplified most explicitly by many pharmaceutical industry funded disease awareness campaigns, more often designed to sell drugs than to illuminate or to inform or educate about the prevention of illness or the maintenance of health. So I don't know if you're familiar with, with what they're talking about, but you see often you see commercials on TV that aren't trying to sell you a drug, which means also that they don't have to list all of those side effects and they d they're not bound by the regulations of the direct consumer advertising rules, but they just promote, they in fact promote disease, right? They promote disease awareness about a certain condition. And when it happens that there's only one drug out there to treat said condition, or even if there's three drugs out there to treat said condition, um, it then helps sell that drug for the company. Um, and so they're also not required to even disclose um, in the ad that it's from a pharmaceutical, that it's being brought to you by a pharmaceutical company. So that's in some ways what they're referring to, but if we want to look at this more broadly, it is this idea that um, what we might need to do in order to sell more drugs is simply um, create new diseases that these new drugs can treat. All right, so what, there's this conflict of interest here. The conflict of interest is, um, that private industry-sponsored research, their goal is not necessarily to um, develop the best drugs for us, but their goal is to develop viable commercial products and not necessarily uh, through hopefully objective scientific data, but that is not their un uh, ultimate goal. And there's been some recent research that has documented the effects of industry funding on scientific research. I'll get to that in a second. So um, another way we might want to understand disease mongering is through um, sociological work that has looked at this phenomenon as well, right? So this idea of medicalization. And this idea that um, here's a couple of sociologists who talk about it who, who say this. Um, so they say medicalization is the practice of categorizing something as a disease, including natural processes such as birth, menopause, and the loss of beauty, thereby making its effects susceptible to being cured or at least ameliorated. Right, so we see that in the case of lifestyle drugs, this might be a key example of what is otherwise referred to as medicalization, right? So we see this in the case of um, anti-aging therapies and others like that, that um, then get categorized not as um, not as something we might like to do as an enhancement, but really get categorized as part of a disease. And here's another one. Um, she says that with the advent of new pharmaceuticals, quote, diagnostic boundaries expand relentlessly outward, creating an ever-growing set of indications for an ever-widening set of illnesses. I think the evidence supports that. So here's, um, just in case you think that this only applies to sort of lifestyle drugs and these drugs that we don't really need that pharmaceutical industry is trying to sell us anyway, I'm going to return to an example that Dr. Kassira talked about, which just appeared yesterday in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is an article that is analyzing what Eli Lilly's marketing team did in order to promote a drug to treat sepsis, right? And so what this shows is that they hired a marketing firm at a spe specific point in time to um, promote this drug, which was very controversial, whose approval was based on one single um, phase three study that the FDA had a lot of warnings attached to it, but the marketing team went ahead anyway and um, very methodically and very purposely planned um, certain kinds of marketing campaigns, or what they were calling educational campaigns, in order to promote 
the sale of their drug. So you can see this rise, the blue line is the rise in sales, and at the bottom it says that the company had predicted annual sales of 300 to 500 million dollars. So it was falling short of that, perhaps because of the controversy, but um, the studies were designed to be released at certain times at, and um, and also, these guidelines were released at certain times in order to increase sales of a drug for sepsis, a very expensive and very controversial drug. So it's interesting that this article, um, sort of critiquing the system, appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine yesterday. And here's the original article, because this is the one that, um, these are the guidelines very similar to the other guidelines I showed you, but this is the one for sepsis that appeared in Critical Care Medicine in 2004. And again, um, these authors all had some connection with the company making the drug, with Eli Lilly. All right, here's another example. So here's the example of continuing medical education. What's going on there? Well, to continue our example of the testosterone therapy, here's a continuing medical education dinner that was held in 2002, which is, if you remember, the, um, this is in just around the time that that fertility and sterility article was released with the guidelines for androgen insufficiency in women. The same time, a dinner sponsored by Boston University School of Medicine, um, a dinner at the Four Seasons Hotel where Jan Schifrin, again the lead author on the New England Journal of, medical, of Medicine article and also one of the authors of the guidelines, um, was presenting a free informational seminar about uh, her results from her testosterone trials, which were funded by Procter & Gamble, and this dinner was funded by Solve Pharmaceuticals, yet another pharmaceutical company that specializes in hormone treatments. So this is, um, so we have this question that arises through the disease awareness campaigns and through continuing medical education of is there a difference and can there be a difference between education and marketing? They're beginning to look a lot alike. As long as we leave it up to the pharmaceutical industry to provide medical education for us, either to physicians or to patients, there's, there's this blending that's going on. So um, pharma in 2001 spent $2.1 billion just supporting continuing medical education. And Marsha Angel um, contends that medical education costs, she, she sort of expands the category out to include m many more things and she puts the number at $35 billion a year. And um, I think it's pretty clear that they wouldn't be spending this money if they didn't think it had a real effect on prescription practices. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence emerging now um, about the ways in which pharmaceutical companies are following and are keeping track of prescription records of specific doctors in order to see if these events are having a, an, an effect on prescription writing. Um, the other way this works, of course, is that these experts in the field are put on speakers bureaus of the pharmaceutical companies and then travel the country at these continuing medical education conferences, um, reporting the latest clinical trials on a drug that is also then promoting that drug before it is even released by the FDA. Right, so let's be clear about this. There's um, a lot of loopholes that are being circumvented through this system. First of all, a pharmaceutical company is not allowed to promote or market a drug that is not yet approved by the FDA, right? But a physician can market this drug to other physicians at continuing medical education conferences with no repercussions, right? So it's considered fair game for a physician to come to a continuing medical education conference and present latest clinical trial data for a drug that's not yet approved, even if that, drug, even if that trial was funded by a pharmaceutical company. Okay, so here's what the AMA says about this idea of how we separate out education from marketing in the form of continuing medical education. I'll just read the highlighted part here. So here's what they say. They say the content of their presentation um, should not be modified or influenced by representatives of industry or other financial contributors, and they do not employ materials whose content is shaped by industry. Well, this seems to be to assume a certain kind of separation between these researchers and the pharmaceutical industry that doesn't really exist, right? Is that data, so a, you know, a, a researcher will collect data at his or her individual medical center that then goes to a central location to be analyzed. They get the data back and they present it at continuing medical education conferences. So is that data shaped by industry? I mean, arguably, I think, I think yes. So, um, so it's very hard to separate this out. You know, a physician will say that, you know, like I, pres I made these slides, nobody had any say in what I'm presenting today, but where they get their data from is through this intermingling that already exists between academic researchers and the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so like I said that there's this loophole for drugs that aren't yet approved, there's the same loophole that exists for off-label uses. 
Right, so the rule is that pharmaceutical companies are not allowed to market drugs to physicians or to patients for off-label use. However, and pharma cannot discuss this with clinicians, their reps are not allowed to discuss this with clinicians either. But other clinicians can. So in this way of what, what the pharmaceutical industry in their, um, in their marketing guidelines call peer-to-peer -peer marketing, physicians travel to speakers bu as speakers bureaus members to other physicians and market these off-label uses for them. And so this depends on an assumed separation between education and marketing that doesn't really exist. All right, so now we're going to get into this issue of, of data that's published in medical journals. So um, here is a summary. So this was a great piece that appeared in 2003 in the New England Journal of Medicine that what it did, it, it did a meta-analysis of other meta-analyses. So all of these um, papers listed on the left-hand side are already meta-analyses of the following. Um, of a specific drug, looking at those studies that were funded by industry, either pre-market pre -market or post-market testing, there were a bunch of studies that are funded by industry and then a few studies that are not funded by industry to test their effectiveness um, or their side effects or to test something about the drug. So these are all different examples of, drug, of articles that were comparing industry-sponsored research to non-industry-sponsored research. And here's the overall finding is that the overall odds ratio of finding in favor of the, of the pharmaceutical drug the odds ratio was 3.6 times that you would find in favor of the pharmaceutical drug if you were funded by industry, right? So let me say that again. So of the articles published um, about drugs, about reporting the results of clinical trials on drugs, if you were funded by industry, there was 3.6 times more likely that you would find in favor of the drug versus if you weren't funded by industry, right? So now this doesn't say, this doesn't tell us why exactly. This doesn't tell us whether there was cherry picking on the part of which articles got published on the part of pharmaceutical industry or whether their um, methods were skewed to come out in favor of the drug in question. But regardless, what gets printed um, looks like it's in favor of the pharmaceutical industry. And of course, there are far more articles published that have pharmaceutical industry funding than those that don't. So um, there's this question as physicians, if we're getting our information from supposedly peer-reviewed medical journals, do we have to question, do we have to question what we read um, given the skewed, what appears as skewed? So then we get to this issue of disclosure, right? Is this going to be the answer to our problems? Well, first of all, we have to deal with the issue of disclosure at all. Is it happening and um, how effective is it? So this just appeared um, this year, a couple months ago in JAMA, this article that received really wide, widespread press about um, how there was a relapse of major depression amongst women um, who discontinued their antidepressant treatment postpartum, right? So if you were a pregnant woman on SSRIs and you went off the drug, you had a much higher relapse rate than those who didn't. Um, so it seems pretty clear, the data seemed pretty clear until it was revealed not, not just a couple days later that um, the authors of this article had not revealed, had not disclosed their conflicts of interest. So what appeared in the following issue, here's the correction from July 12th, here are all the conflicts of interest that these authors had. Um, and you can see all of them are for drugs that produce SSRIs, right? So the results of the drug were women should stay on their SSRIs um, to avoid risk of relapse of major depression. Um, so the authors actually argued that they didn't think they needed to disclose this because they didn't think it influenced them in any way. There was no way it could have influenced them because of the data, they didn't collect the data themselves, right? But does it, does it um, sort of bias them in other kinds of ways to read the data in a certain way or to even investigate the study to begin with? Um, so, this, so we have this problem of non-disclosure of financial conflicts of interest, of researchers deciding when or when or what when they do or when they don't matter. Um, but, and so as a result of this, uh, Catherine DeAngelis of JAMA wrote an editorial just following this, and here's what she says. So she's looking at the, this influence of money on medical science, and here's what she says about that. For-profit companies also can exert inappropriate influence in research via control of study data and statistical analyses, ghostwriting, managing all or most aspects of manuscript preparation, and dictating to investigators the journals to which they should submit their manuscripts. All right, so these are all things, I and mean, some of these things are um, undoubtedly unethical and illegal even, right? So ghostwriting we can all pretty much condemn as a as an unethical practice. But um, others of these are pretty um, commonplace 
for academic industry relationships, right? So it's pretty commonly the case that um, if you're involved with an academic, with a uh, pharmaceutical industry, that you need to get approval from them in order to publish an article, right? Or they might delay publication for a certain amount of time in order to protect their confidentiality of their, um, of their drug. So some of these things are pretty par for the course, and so what are we supposed to do about this? And, and in fact, is disclosure going to help us in this regard? So here's what um, DeAngelis' solutions were. Um, so how can we preserve the integrity of journals while ensuring that they serve as vehicles for dissemination of scientific information that can help cl clinicians provide better care for their patients, right? That seems like a pretty good goal. All published articles should be scientifically sound and as objective and unbiased as possible. Well, okay, yes. <laughs> um, rigorous peer review and careful editorial evaluation. So there has been the process um, on the part of uh, top medical journals that they're requiring all the data that you cannot just submit an article for publication anymore if you've been funded by a pharmaceutical industry, but you need to submit your raw data as well so that it can be critically evaluated. And to ensure that readers are aware of the author's financial relationships and potential conflicts of interest so that these readers can interpret the article in light of that information. So this to me raises um, the question that Dr. Kassira was just addressing. I'm not really sure we all know how to, how to critically evaluate information when conflict of interest has been disclosed. Right, so we're reading an article and we see, you know, we see this huge list of sponsors. And so how does that help us read the article better? I think we might need some re-education and, and um, critical reading skills in order to help us evaluate what it means in the face of disclosure of conflict of interest. All right, here's one last example. And you know, it's, it may seem like a frivolous example, but it actually has a very strong effect on patients themselves. So this also emerged in my research on Viagra and on the testosterone patch for women. Um, so, like I said, the pharmaceutical industry is not allowed to market drugs that are not yet available directly to consumers, right? So what do, we, what do they do? Well, they have these researchers, again, who are in the process of, of um, conducting these clinical trials and are funded by the pharmaceutical industry, act as mediators between the drug company and the public. And this is before the drug is even approved. Right, so they do this through various media forums. I'm sure we all know they appear on Oprah, they're, um, they have internet sites, and they appear as the experts in magazine articles to um, men and women. And this, of course, benefits both the drug company and the researchers in status and prestige and getting their name out there. So there's, it's, a sort of, it's perceived as a win-win situation for them. All right, so here's, here's the, um, what may seem like an outrageous but actually fairly commonplace example. Um, so there are two researchers that are pretty well known in the field of, sexu of female sexual dysfunction research. Um, Jennifer Berman, who is a urologist, and Laura Berman, who is a clinical psychologist. They were at UCLA at the time of publication of this book, and they had started a new sexual medicine center there. Um, so this book was um, released in 2001. They appeared on Oprah on Valentine's Day of 2001, and subsequently the book went to number one on Amazon.com. And in fact, Oprah's bulletin board never received more comments than after their appearance on the show. So um, these women who, who um, ran clinical trials that were funded by pharma pharmaceutical companies out of their center at UCLA, they were running um, clinical trials on Viagra for women in the days when we still thought that might be a viable option. And then they also ran some trials on the testosterone patch for women. All right, so early 2002, they um, launched their website. So it's the Network for Excellence in Women's Sexual Health. Um, you can see here they are welcoming us to their site as doctors, and they have the Female Sexual Medicine Center. And so you can see the cover of their, um, the front page of their website uh, with this Viagra and Women link linked you to a description of their clinical trial results of the study that they had just done through their center of clinical trial results showing that Viagra was beneficial and efficacious to treat female sexual dysfunction. Now, this study appeared on their website before it had undergone any peer review and before it appeared in any medical journal. Right? So there's nothing stopping them from posting that data on a website. And then later on, they also um, 
announced their results and their uh, endorsement in, in many ways of the testosterone patch for women and saying that it's on the fast track, the FDA fast track, and soon will be available to you. Now note, Procter & Gamble couldn't have advertised this, so instead they, the researchers who were receiving money from Procter & Gamble posted on their website as a way of sort of priming the consumer base that this drug is on the way. Um, now, unfortunately for the Bermans and for Procter & Gamble, it was not on the FDA fast track. In fact, the committee voted against approval, um, saying that we needed much more long-term data about a new hormonal treatment for women, which is, I think is pretty understandable. Nonetheless, uh, what appeared after that on their website is that, don't worry, more studies on this hormone of desire of women will take place and will be available through your physician someday soon. Okay. So in conclusion here, so what do we have to say about conflicts of interest? So there has been greater attention paid to these conflicts of interest. I mean, we, we see this coming up in lots of places. The New England Journal of Medicine article just published yesterday, JAMA's editorials on this issue, the changing standards for medical journals on disclosure of conflicts of interest all point to the fact that greater attention is being paid to these issues. And there have been some changes on the part of pharma in response to um, this, this outcry and on the part of medical institutions, as Dr. Kinsir indicated, and on the part of medical journals. But we have to ask, is this enough? And how can we get at what I see as the insidious and intrinsic aspects of conflicts of interest when we have academic industry relationships? So clearly we need physicians to be critical lead readers and consumers of medical information that they receive, given that the bulk of medical information that they do receive has been in some way shaped by pharmaceutical pharmaceutical industry. Um, and this awareness and um, you know, understanding that conflicts, conflicts of interest on the part of physicians can indeed change patient care. That is it. Thank you for your time. Yes? Uh, two comments. Uh, several years ago, I was at a a uh, college reunion and a uh, friend who was working for a drug company at the time put a pie chart on the board and the company, 36% of their uh, uh, money was spent on marketing and advertising and 19% on research and development. Right. Now the other thing is even newer, right? Cut this out of the that very uh, liberal journal, Wall Street Journal. <laughs> on uh, Monday morning, and it talks about heart medication approved for blacks and faces like a battle. Uh, this new medicine is Vigor for congestive heart failure. Uh, one, method, one reason Vigor isn't being more widely prescribed is price. But then you get over here on the other side, and it turns out, well, it says here, the price for buy deal is in line with the value that it brings to patients. <laughs> well, isn't that a bunch of so it, well, anyway, it turns out that uh, buy deal is hydralazine and right. so sorbide, right. which we were using back in the 70s and right. 80s to treat this. But they put it together in one pill and it increased the price four, five, six, seven times. Yeah, I think now, if there's any ethics in the medical drug company, I don't know where it is. This is, this is terrible. Yeah, I know of this case. That's exactly right. So two drugs that have gone off patent were put, put together, relabeled, repackaged, and now have a new patent. And moreover, um, are, is being marketed to a specific group of people without very good evidence that it actually does work better for blacks versus whites. Um, so it, it does seem to be a clear case of marketing rather than science, I think. Did you read the one several years ago in the Wall Street Journal about the drugs for orphans? price for a patient there, $200,000 to $600,000 a year. Right, it's the flip side of Viagra, right? What, what do we give up when we spend a lot of our research and development dollars and a lot of our healthcare costs on lifestyle drugs? Yes? Um, I did my research fellowship with actually the guy that's the scientific founder of the science on which Viagra is based. And when I worked with him some years ago, I thought he was one of the most ethical, brilliant people. And he just got an award from the Heart Failure Society. So 
members. And I guess my question to the view is, what happens along the way yeah. so that people who graduate from this medical school or other fine medical schools who, who have a different take on things, I mean, should use that word as well. Right. Um, suddenly, or maybe not so suddenly, become yeah. this whole problem. Well, I, I have some ideas. I'll, I'll ask you all, too. I think that it's not uniform across the board. I think for some researchers, they feel um, like they're just doing the science. What, what industry wants to do with it is none of my concern, right? So if industry, so he does this science that he think is valuable and ethical um, about the, the efficacy of this drug. And then if it gets used to market the drug to a certain population of people that's inappropriate, well, that's, he didn't, he didn't promote that, right? It just gets used in this other kind of way. Um, and I think for others, uh, there, is a, there is a certain amount of seduction and allure to working with industry. And you know, it, these things all work together. It's, there are many types of conflicts of interest. So one might be financial. But another, of course, is that in working with industry, you get a lot of publications. And those publications usually show a positive result, which always fares well in your citation record. Um, so I think that there's many conflicts at play. And I, don't, I think financial is very important, but I actually think that the others play an equally important role in terms of status and prestige. Anybody, anybody want to comment on that question? Anybody have any ideas of their own? Yes. Uh, Herbert Hoover said that when he was president, uh, I think you could transpose this a little bit. He said the problem with capitalism is the capitalists. <laughs> damn greedy. Well, this may be the problem with medicine here is once the, uh, we right. get transposed into the capitalistic uh, aspect of it, it's greed. The more money you've got, the more you want. Right. So the increasing privatization and commercialization of medicine has contributed to the problem, too. I'd like, to raise, I'd like to raise a question about the journals themselves, yeah. which, as you well know, contain a great deal of advertising. Yeah. What about the freedom of editors, reviewers, et cetera, in the face of that much advertising, kind of a hidden conflict of interest? I think that's an excellent point. I mean, in other venues, we know that advertising influences editorial, influences content, editorial content, right? You are beholden to your sponsors. Um, so I, haven't, I don't know anybody who's looked into that issue specifically in the case of medical journals, but we know it in the case of other, you know, we, you know do you know Adbusters, the magazine, right? They refuse to take um, advertisements or consumer reports, right? They don't have advertisements for that very reason. They don't want to be beholden to a certain company. So my guess is that, of course, that goes on. Um, and you, we've seen it in, not with advertisement, but in more subtle ways in terms of publication of data. There's been some evidence to show that as some medical journals stiffen their requirements about disclosure and about needing to submit raw data, that the um, pharmaceutical industries are boycotting submitting articles to those journals and are submitting elsewhere. Right. There's also evidence that these journals are representing major profit centers. For example, those that are sponsored by medical societies are major profit centers. Yeah. So that's another problem with the I think that's right. Yes. I think part of the problem here yeah. is that with academia, there's such a great pressure to bring in funding. Yeah. So everyone can get United grants, United grants, and so they might open soft funding. Right. And that's part of the problem. Yeah. So there's um, as there's less public monies available, we need to turn to private sources. So the increasing percentage of private funding at medical centers, I think, has contributed to the problem. The physician's office is a problem, too, as far as funding. Mm. I went to the OBGYN annual meeting in Washington. I hadn't been to the big meeting for a while. I was appalled that a third of the booths are now on cosmetic, laser. We, I heard that question before. So the physicians are trying to keep their offices open and pay their bills by doing things that right. have to be reimbursed by insurance. And in the, in the middle of this uh, floor, you could get a glycolic peel. Yes. There were some things that this I know them. were unethical or not even anywhere near. You could buy shoe sole things in there at the OBGYN meeting. I was appalled and disgusted that this has happened to our profession. 
and until we fix our whole system, this is a small part of it. And when we read Marcy Ankle's book, and she talks about ways to fix it, I don't know if any of those solutions are being implemented, right. but I, I love it when I can read a book that at the end of it says, here are some solutions. Right. Just as critical conditions talks about possible solutions <laughs> to the healthcare bureaucracy problems. Right. Most of them just write about the problems but without a possible solution. I think you're right, and I think what your point, what you're you're pointing to is are there professional norms and standards that need to be reenacted or enacted that as a profession, does medicine need to stand up to this and say that this is not appropriate? When we sort of had this slippery slope into what we see now, which is um, selling of vitamin supplements at doctor's offices or do you have any information as to whether the problem is, is different, worse, not as bad in Europe or even in Canada? Um, there is a different relationship between, well, I, I, I should say that most of the clinical trials that go on now are multinational trials, right? So the same kinds of problems of having researchers in other countries who are also providing clinical care, that, that problem still exists. Um, I think that the public's view of drugs in this country is very different than it is in Europe. And in part, we see that in the face of direct-to-consumer advertising, which is allowed here but not allowed in any European country. Right? So we are the only country, aside from New Zealand, that allows for these direct-to-consumer ads to patients. So I think that that has sort of, that is both sort of a cause and effect right, of our different view of the relationships between drugs and medicine. Um, as for what's going on in, in research, I think that the problem is as widespread. A, a, lot of the, a lot of the people I talk to are actually not U.S.-based researchers, but in the Netherlands in particular and, and other places. You know, uh, this meeting has been very good at describing all of the problems, but I don't think that any solutions have, that are real Right. There probably are. I hope there are solutions that we're not that we haven't yet figured out yet. Um, I think we have. You know, some is. So I, I have to be honest with you. I've been doing talks like this for three years now, and this is this is the first time I haven't gotten a, a very critical comment that they don't believe my data or they don't. So I think that the public perception of the problem has changed, and I think that that might be the first step in creating um, real solutions. That as a profession, if you can stand up to the face in the face of these conflicts of interest, understand that they are having a real effect and therefore you want to minimize them and eliminate them. I think that that is sort of step one in the process. Do you think the last trial would change our perception? Um, maybe, but this some, does seem to be a slightly different issue. Um, Vioxx, the Vioxx scandal seems to me to indicate a failure in the FDA system, right, more, more than anything else. Um, and this is something more subtle, I think, that people are, that physicians in particular are, are becoming aware of. Yes? There may be some progress. I put on a cardiology program once a year at our hospital, and we now have a new two-page faculty disclosure statement that we have to use for the 2007 conference. So I think there's increasing awareness, thanks to you and other people. Yeah. Right, and I think medical institutions, academic medical centers have taken the lead on that in that, in that way. I went to a conference last month on conflicts of interest um, in research at the um, Cleveland Clinic where a lot, of the, a lot of the medical institutions are now saying that they are, have much more stringent standards for disclosure than they ever did before. Right. That is so new. A couple of years ago, that never would have happened. Right. I see that as kind of a baby step toward uh, identifying, for example, to get Marshall's, one of Marshall's concerns, there's a financial vacuum that's going to have to be filled. Right. As some of this money gets pulled out, as right. pharmaceutical companies are putting in, where are the academic medical centers going to get the budgetary support for some of the things that are not going on that are right. important? 
that are available. Right. Right. Well, there have been some other proposals made, you know, that a pharmaceutical company can donate money that goes into a pool that then gets doled out for certain kinds of events that the medical center decides where they get spent on, but no, no uh, pharmaceutical company in particular gets associated with any event in particular. I don't know if the pharmaceutical industry will continue to, to support those, but that might be one solution to that problem. But I think you're right. I think Case um, is on the vanguard of the few schools that have started to implement those kinds of changes that I think are great. I'm uncomfortable about the distinguish between the, the, the sh distinction between warranted skepticism and, and paranoia. Mm -hmm. But if if you were to speak to a much larger group than this, uh, I would expect that the that at least some of the negative comments that you would get would be paid industry representatives. <laughs> wow. Um, you know, I just saw some data recently. Um, so you know, the Neurontin. The Rotten case went to trial. So as a result of that, there is a lot of court documents available and, I mean, data like you can't believe. And one of the things that emerged from that is that physicians were paid $200 per leading question that they asked in a continuing medical education conference. So they were planted to ask leading questions. Right. 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 Yeah, I think that's an excellent. We we have d um, devolved our responsibility onto private companies and private corporations to provide our new drugs. No doubt about it. And and of course, like this is they have very different um, interests and motivations than. Uh, an academic medical center would in developing a new drug. So no doubt in my mind, and I say that all the time, that um, these practices we're looking at, we're outraged by them, but these are considered very commonplace in other areas of marketing, other commodities that we have you know, for marketing a new laundry detergent. Right? They would use the same kinds of tactics that they're using with physicians. Mm -hmm. to uh, medical centers and universities mm -hmm. to conduct research which would not be necessarily biased by pharmaceutical right. I think that's an excellent point. That's a very unpopular stance right I now. <laughs> yeah. Most people would say, I forget the, you know, the horse has already left this barn, whatever the expression is, uh, and, and that it does not look like public funding will be coming back in those kinds of numbers anytime soon. But I, it would solve the problem, wouldn't it? Yes. People are still, that's probably true, it's not going back soon, but the people who are talking about this are, are people, some speakers for community, um, the physicians for national health care programs, and also right. people who are affiliated with Bonnie Right. And, and the ID group would be that um, the ID group is really focused on the community, and the community is 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 focused on the and not be rewarded for the Me Too. Uh, and this issue of the amount of money that's spent for research, everyone that is, is saying that's too hard on the drug companies says, oh, but they have to spend so much money to develop a drug, they have to spend that much money, you know, they have to charge that much money after they do all this work. And, and then it's, they don't want to look at the information that the prior speaker showed about the profit margin for the Fortune 500 and the profit margin for the... Uh, mm -hmm. Right. I think that's a, a good point. Part of the privatization of the research means that they just need to find a profitable drug, not necessarily the drug that we need most. Right. So it does look like Me Too drugs are sort of the most economical to develop. It's another manifestation of how it's getting worse is the fact that in the 70s uh, it was two to one. Now it's three to one, more than three to one.
Yeah, I mean, that's sort of a Freudian slip in some ways, because that is exactly the terminology they use within their own. They, they, they do see physicians as their consumers, right, because they're the ones who are responsible for writing the prescription. I think this is a culture-wide problem in the United States of America. There are many different facets. The way you start changing it is what we've done here today, having these discussions, expanding these discussions, educating our physicians, yeah. educating our, our physicians patients. Out of the community. Yeah. These talks should not be just here at academic medical centers. These need to be community hospitals so that everybody who suspects this very strongly, that it's presented to them and they know what's going on. That's one way of really combating this and turning this around. Mm -hmm. Physicians are so, we're not unified the way we should be with regard to dealing with this. Look at how many people are compromised, at least theoretically, in very illustrious, prestigious institutions. Right. right. They don't believe it affects them yet. Of right. Not. Mm -hmm. That's an area of future. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all so much for your time and your comments.